The Satanic Panic. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back, Dr. Sledge. How are you, my friend? Doing wonderful, man. Thank you so much for having for having me back on. It's always a, a great time to hang out with you and the <laughs> and the crowd and talk about strange and unusual things. Yeah, this is going to be an, a, a very interesting one. I figure I might as well let people know a little bit about you. I almost wanted to just skip to your education because I'm on your website, uh, justinsledge.com forward slash bio, listening, you know, reading what you have here. Dr. James Justin Sledge was born and raised in a proud working class Mississippi family. He learned the fundamental value of labor from his father, who was a pipe fitter and a crucial importance of an unwaged labor from his mother. A first generation college student, Dr. Sledge earned his undergraduate degree at Miss Millsaps College. Am I saying that properly? Mm -hmm. Then went uh, for a DRS in religious studies, Western esotericism and related currents at the University, I think it is, uh, Van Amsterdam, and an MA and PhD in philosophy at the University of Memphis. He is currently a part-time professor of philosophy and religion at several institutions in the metro Detroit area and a popular local educator. You have a massive YouTube channel, so let me give a... Did I mispronounce any of that here? No, 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 not that it matters. Okay, not that it matters. This is the website I'm reading the bio on. You can go check out Dr. Sledge's uh, website and uh, follow up. He even uh, has special ancient books, occultic books and stuff you can get for purchase when he's selling them if he's not trying to harvor, harvest them all <laughs> himself because uh, he's into that. We were just talking about before this live how weird we are and we're into these weird niche topics, but you know it's fun stuff. So yeah. he has a YouTube channel that actually just broke uh, 199 K really 200 K. So you're at the two look, I just refreshed. It. it was like 20 minutes ago that you must've just broke it. Um, his YouTube channel is growing rapidly. He just had a viral video right now going on with Mary Magdalene and secret teachings. He goes into the occult, you name it. There's all sorts of fun stuff. Would you like to tell us anything about your YouTube channel? Yeah. So what I work on is, uh, uh, what is called the academic study of Western esotericism. So, Things like alchemy, Kabbalah, magic, the occult, uh, but again, approached from a uh, from an academic point of view. So the channel's not, I don't know, cluttered over with conspiracy theories and crazy stuff. So it's uh, it's weird stuff to be sure, but again, always from an academic and uh, scholarly perspective. So we cover a lot of uh, I don't know, pretty obscure, pretty arcane things, um, and uh, we, but we do it from a from an academic perspective. I enjoy that. I mean, you've confronted crazy ideas on this channel, even like up front. And, you know, uh, we delved into bigotry within uh, Judaism, which is mm -hmm. like, you know, <laughs> that's a tough discussion, to be honest with you, especially post Holocaust. But uh, we we absolutely confront these ideas head on and we discuss the good and the bad. And in fact, you point out like the good and the bad, even in your own traditions that are um what people want to highlight, but uh, when when people are obsessed, those red flags seem to stem up. Even for me as a non-Jew, I'm like, hey, something's not right here, dude. Like, why is everybody being like this towards these people? Uh, anyway, go subscribe to his YouTube channel and check out his website. We also uh, encourage people to join the Myth Vision, uh, become a member of the channel. Do you have a membership option on yours? I don't know. I, I think that the primary way that uh, folks can support uh, Esoterica and support my work is uh, by taking a look at my Patreon. So, uh, okay. so if folks want to check me out on Patreon, they're more than welcome to to do that there. Well, if you become a member, sh member, and I hope that you start it too, if you're going to do more live streams, Dr. Sledge, um, and I think maybe comments do this as well. When you're a member of the YouTube channel, you have a special tag, mm -hmm. which makes you elect, Okay. It has nothing to do with being a chosen race. It has to do with being chosen in general, right? We're, we're reinterpreting things here. Um, and so please become a member of Myth Vision's YouTube channel if you want to be an elect one. Also on the Patreon here, I uh, give you guys heads up, early access to things. I've done three edits so far of 12 videos I did when I went to Boston to interview Paula Fredrickson. Nobody's doing this. Nobody. I mean, like... I'm not going to say there aren't interviews out there, but like if you go look up Paula Fredrickson videos, you're going to find old interviews she did with like news reporters, or you're going to find videos on colleges that she's gave lectures at. Never like, hey, I'm in her apartment interviewing her, asking her whatever questions I want, diving deep. So help us out on Myth Vision. We have a lot of stuff, hundreds of videos, John J. Collins, Joel Baden, Elaine Pagels. Like I have like probably 30 videos that I have not released to the public 
on my Patreon with the lame pagels. Just to give you an example. We also have the course on ancient Greek mysteries. I mention this each time. Samothracian, Eleusinian, Orphic Dionysian, Isis Osiris, Pymandrius and Corpus Hermeticum, Sibylle and Attis, and of course, Christianity. Paul uses mystery language. You might want to see um, what a scholarly approach to this subject is rather than just zeitgeist. Oh, Christianity is just a copy or a complete borrow, and it's just a mystery cult. There's a lot more to that than what meets the eye. So it takes a lot of skill and effort. Also finding Moses with Bart Ehrman. Now there's my shameless plugs, but <laughs> I'm not ashamed. So I don't know why we call it that. Hey, no, it's uh no, we have to keep the lights on. And uh, this is great scholarship, Derek. You do a really great job. You and Neil both do a fantastic job of, uh, of, of really getting the uh, getting scholars out of the ivory tower and getting them into uh, spaces like YouTube where popular education is desperately needed mm. because as I, I tell my other uh, scholars look if we're not uh, populating youtube where people really want to get knowledge what it's going to get populated with is insane people you know that firsthand yeah <laughs> from being I know on that. youtube right not just from seeing other content like the kind of questions and comments you you and i both receive 24 yeah. 7 reflects the reality that conspiracies and all sorts of wild stuff like what we're going to talk about today right. runs rampant. And today we're going to talk about the satanic panic, but see there's something unique about you for those who haven't seen your YouTube channel on this topic. It's not just that, you know, about the satanic panic. It's not that you just know about the occults and you know about the secret teachings and Gnosticism and you name it. Okay. All of the different secret society kind of ideas. It's, you were actively involved in some of this controversy that has happened when the satanic panic was spreading like a wildfire on the news. Yeah. So, I, was a, I was very much a victim of the satanic panic. And that, I want know. to hear about this. In yeah. fact, I was hoping that, that we could get into this. I know it's very s sensitive material, but it's important. People understand what is the satanic panic? So the satanic panic is uh, a name given to a general moral panic that began uh, in the early 80s, 1980s, primarily in the United States. And the general idea was that there was a vast uh, international network of Satanists uh, that were using um, daycares, heavy metal music, Dungeons and Dragons, and, um, and other kinds of things to basically re recruit people into this vast network of, of, of Satanists. And this would include things like um, uh, doing satanic rituals, sacrificing babies, uh, uh, assaulting children, um, a whole wide range of things that were going on, uh, allegedly. And uh, as this went on, this became a very popular topic on daytime television. Uh, this became the subject of books and documentaries, documentaries. And eventually what came out as uh, sci scientists and scholars began to study it was that there was no evidence for any of this, that uh, people began to basically spin yarn. And in all of these cases, in these uh, many different daycare facilities or uh, in the heavy metal music or in Dungeons and Dragons, they never found any evidence that there was widespread satanic ritual abuse happening, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So basically it's a moral panic in the same way that uh, there've been moral panics around all kinds of things through history, but it is a, a specific moral panic on the idea that there is this network of Satanists throughout the world that are causing people to, to join uh, the satanic organization and do all kinds of bad things. So, uh, so that's the general overview of what it was. We can get more into the granular aspects of how it actually developed and how it also leans on historical ideas that come from the Middle Ages. And so in many ways, a lot of the ideas that really were built up into the satanic panic are actually coming out of the medieval witch hunts and, and things like that. So there's survivals of those things. But of course, the panic in some ways never totally ended. Uh, the modern version of, of course, is the QAnon conspiracy theory that uh, also holds the idea that an international conspiracy of right. um, Satanists or elites are, are uh, involved in uh, sexually assaulting children or harvesting the adrenochrome from their bodies or something like this. So it's a rehash of wow. these kinds of ideas that actually reach back to the middle ages. It's, it's really mind boggling. Cause when I, I don't know the origins or how this developed, I'm curious to learn about that from you today, if possible. And also what involvement, uh, you had with being a victim of this situation. I think of it as propaganda, right? Cause I'm, I, I don't know the inner, 
details that actually are involved. Like someone might look at the Apostle Paul to give you an analogy and say, oh, this guy's in it for power. This guy's in it for money. He doesn't even believe what he's doing. I think that's false. I think this guy actually believes what he's doing, what he's saying, whether it's right or wrong or true is irrelevant. Um, and one could still say it's somewhat propaganda, but in the, in light of the satanic panic, I'm reminded of those commercials they used to have where they were anti marijuana and they talked about how the, the neighbor smoking pot or rape, you know, and go Mm -hmm. and, and rob and run into your house and do all this stuff. And it's like, no, like this is propaganda. Is this reefer madness was, yeah, the sort of reefer madness was an example of another moral panic. Um, temperance movement was a moral panic. Um, the anti-absinthe movement was a moral panic. So there've been lots of moral panics, uh, through history. Uh, Christianity was a subject of a moral panic. The Romans were horrified of Christianity early on. Uh, they blamed all kinds of things on, on how bad Christianity was. So, um, which is ironic, but, but yeah, what we have, uh, is again, this, the satanic panic is a specific kind of moral panic that, uh, mostly existed from the 1980s, uh, and didn't really come to a complete conclusion. Uh, probably until the early 2000s. So it's a 20 year long panic. Take us into what started it, if you don't mind. So the earliest examples we have of the panic begin with a book called Michelle Remembers. So this was a bombshell best selling book that uh, was published in, uh, I think, 1980. And in this book, a, a woman alleges to have recovered memories from her childhood in the 1950s in the, in the Pacific Northwest and in, in, in your neck of the woods, where she, through the process of uh, memory recollection, uh, which is a very spurious form of psychotherapy, she recovered memories of being uh, abused by a satanic cult led by her father. And she has all kinds of very horrifying things that she lays out in the, in this, in this book. And there's all kinds of weird shenanigans that go on in this book. Like her uh, therapist became her, her husband at some point. Like they ended up becoming like romantically involved with each other, which is a clear ethical violation. That's not supposed to happen. She converts to Catholicism, which is the, the therapist's religion during the course of the therapy, which is also a violation of, of, hmm. of patient stuff. And over time, what ends up happening is that uh, this book, Michelle Remembers, is published. It becomes a bestseller. Uh, she goes on the circuit of daytime television shows like, uh, I don't know, like uh, the Geraldo show and things like that. This is in, featured in People magazine. It really gets a lot of coverage. And over time, what ends up happening is that people begin to fact check a lot of the very, frankly, crazy things that are said in this book. And some of them are so outrageous that it just doesn't make any sense. Like she had horns sewn onto her body and then ripped off. Like there will be scars of that. You can't do that to someone without there being physical evidence of it. But also um, a lot of the facts didn't line up. So for instance, she says that she was part of a 54 day or uh, ordeal of satanic rituals, but there's no evidence of her being out of school for any length of time. And be be evidence if you're gone for 54 days, Mm -hmm. her sisters don't remember any of this stuff which is conspicuous, right? Um, there's all kinds of things that go on that discoobrate this book, but none of that mattered because by the time the book was out, other people, other psycho, uh, psycho- psychotherapists were also beginning to experiment with this regressive memory stuff. And the, there was a feedback loop that began where all kinds of people began to remember all kinds of, and I guess I remember yeah. all kinds of satanic ritual abuse and evidence was never produced for it. You know, um, you know, if you're harvesting tens of thousands of babies uh, to produce for human sacrifices, they, some of that would show up somewhere. And we just don't find evidence. Or if there are hundreds of thousands of Satanists all through the country uh, gathering in the woods somewhere, someone's going to see something like that. Um, and it never happened. And so the panic really begins there in the early 1980s. Uh, and it spreads from the Pacific Northwest uh, out through the rest of the country and eventually kind of goes all over the rest of the world. Um, and there are big, big localized versions of it, like the McMartin, um, McMartin child school, uh, child, uh, care scandal, where basically an entire, um, uh, an entire, uh, child care facility was arrested and charged with engaging in child molestation under the guise of Satanism. And, uh, they were eventually acquitted. And a lot of the things that, that were said about this were, were, leading questions asked to a bunch of children and many of the things that children said were completely outrageous. They're little kids. And, um, this happened over and over and over again and ruined a great many people's lives. It ruined a great many people's lives. 
I'm reminded of a video I did a while back with a psychologist about Savannah syndrome. I think it was, or some, I can't, um, I'm having a hard time remembering Havana, maybe uh, anyway, in it, he's describing a panic that happened back when we were testing nuclear bombs out in the Pacific, uh, pretty much just testing our nuclear weaponry out. Mm -hmm. And, people were starting to take notice or they heard about these testings and they didn't know what the results would be. So people started to observe their windshields and notice little, little fractal crack looking or uh, objects within the glass. And they started to think this is um, particles coming down from the sky that are affecting our windshields and probably affecting us, our breathing, our, our everything. And they started panicking and started sharing it out. It went on the news. People started saying like, Hey, the nuclear weapons are causing issues and our windshields are starting to show these visible things. But when they scientists looked at the actual factories that made these windshields, they realized like in the process of making the windshields, this is what the production is, right? So this false alarm started spreading and everybody started calling 911. Hey, my windshield has it too. Like everybody starts thinking this bad thing. And I don't know what that is or what that technical term is in how we would label that when humans in general run with this kind of superstition in their mind that they think is true, but it's not. Yeah. It's a rumor feedback loop is what we call it. Actually. Um, rumor feedback loops are where, uh, once a rumor begins to get going, um, it's actually really hard to stop it because once people become, once people are afraid of something, whether it's radiation or the, the devil, um, when someone comes out and says, hey, I think we need to think critically about this and gather more evidence, that's a really unpopular position to take. Right. And uh, and so when law enforcement and other kinds of things would would do that, uh, they were very unpopular. In fact, it would uh, um, during the satanic panic in the 1980s, mobs would form and they would just say, if the police aren't going to deal with these Satanists, we're going to deal with them. And they would just threaten to rampage through towns and gather up anyone who was listening to heavy metal music or the nerds or the guys playing Dungeons and Dragons or, or whatever. Or if you just didn't go to church or if you're, you know, uh, whatever, you could really be in a situation where a, a crowd could could le legitimately threaten to, you know, threaten to do violence in your town. And this happened repeatedly during the panic. So, um, so yeah, the law enforcement often gave in to these rumor feedback loops and uh, they would bring in occult experts. Uh, most of the people had no actual academic degrees. They were basically preachers who had studied sometimes even medieval witch hunting manuals. And um, uh, and basically became overnight experts in the occult. And these people be on national television telling everyone that there are hundreds of thousands of Satanists all through the United States doing X, Y and Z. And, you know, why wouldn't people believe that if it's on television and being repeated over and over and over? I will say that um, one of the main people that spread this um, conspiracy theory were was Geraldo Rivera. Um, and he actually ruined many people's lives with this kind of stuff. And ultimately, uh, he did apologize for it in 1995. Uh, he had to, he came out in public and said, yeah, I was wrong about all that. I really stoked the fires of something that ruined people's lives. And mm. he subsequently apologized. Of course, that didn't undo the damage that he had done. Right. But, um, but yeah, it is interesting how these rumor feedback loops can go. And uh, the satanic panic being, being an example of, of uh, one of them. I'm, I'm a little blown away by all of this. So I'm going to ask, we're going to get into your personal situation, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. But before we do, I, I found it. Someone reminded me in the chat and they said it's uh, hysteria. And I'm like, oh, that's right. That's right. So I found the video that I did and uh, with the person I did this with, uh, it was a very interesting episode where we dove into this. Let me, hold on, let me share it like this just to play the intro because this is the kind of stuff that Look you would this. imagine. This is a site that has spooked many people in different parts of the East County. Near El Cajon, some neighbors are calling him Chupacabra after the legendary creature. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. In seconds. What? Oh, oh, oh. 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 <laughs> is it a shape-shifting object? Is it Bezos? Is it Branson? What is it? Is it a UFO? G'day everyone, artist Wayne Dowson here and it's time to weigh in on the Bigfoot phenomenon. Oh 
These men are consummate snowball artists. They use sense and nerve gases to induce hallucinations. People think they're seeing ghosts. Anyway, I put that little thing together. I was a little proud of that intro because it's like, yeah, yeah the, the hysteria that develops from this, it, trying to put the, the like whatever back into the can is nearly impossible. So I want to get your personal situation while we're educating people on the satanic panic because you have a personal um experience with it not only in learning and educating yourself about it how were you involved and in what way were you a victim of this whole thing yeah so it, i've mentioned this on my episode in the satanic panic where um Let me share that for you. yeah in 1997 a young man came to my school and after uh, murdering his mother actually uh, began killing people at my school is one of the earliest uh, school shootings. Ooh. And uh, in the course of of the of the subsequent investigation, several people were arrested, including me. And um, in the course of this, and um, what emerged was this idea that the, the school shooting was the result of a, a giant uh, a satanic conspiracy involving several young men. And over the course of uh, a year and a half uh, during the, the investigation, there were very serious charges uh, levied against me and several other people. And what ultimately came out of it was that um, no evidence was ever found for this satanic cult that they alleged had had, had plotted had plotted uh, this uh, this murder uh, murders, and so uh, yeah, this was a huge thing in my life where I was you know accused of, of really serious crimes, and um, in the course you know in the course of the actual investigation, no evidence was ever produced, and um, the charges were dropped. And then like in many cases and in many cases of the satanic uh, panics, you have a situation where when people are accused of uh, engaging in satanic murders or whatever, the media is all about covering that and all about making it a big deal and they cover it to you know to no end. Uh, but when the charges are dropped and the dust settles and there was never evidence of, a, of an actual satanic cult, uh, the media never really covered that. And so what you get is a situation where uh, even to this day, if you look at the at the coverage on the internet of uh, what happened in, in 1997, there's a ton of evidence of the arrest. There's a ton of evidence of of all kinds of dreadful things that they alleged happened. But when the case dissolved and all the charges were dropped and that was the end of it, there's basically no media coverage. And so this also happened in, in many, many other cases of um, of the satanic panic. And this had the effect of, of, of ruining people's lives. Mm. Um, I won't say that it ruined my life. Uh, I will say that it had a, a pretty negative impact on my life. But it also led me down, um, led me down the the path of researching things like the occult academically, and also uh, down the path of looking at uh, moral panics like the satanic panic, and looking at things like the medieval witch hunts, and really getting at uh, why these conspiracy theories are so dangerous. Um, and the reason why they are so dangerous is they're baseless speculation that can ruin people's lives. So. And this is what I would say to people that uh, conspiracy theories are all fun and games uh, until you're on the receiving end of being the victim of one. And so that's why, uh, for instance, on my channel, uh, I don't truck with conspiracy theorists at all. I don't I, I take an evidence based approach. And um, if you don't have evidence for your claims and right, stay the hell away from me. <laughs> Or the way that uh, evidence can be uh, manipulated. In light of the satanic panic, of course, this is all vapor. But the way that evidence is used by some people within uh, conspiracy-minded uh, groups, yeah, that it can be very harmful. I imagine if we went back to Nazi Germany uh, and we listened to the propaganda and listened to the Third Reich and their preaching on the issues of Jews and people that are, of course, minorities in the situation – like that probably they probably had like a spin on so many things that made it convincing to Germans to participate in this action. Would it, would yeah. it be wrong in that or? I mean, of course, there's always nothing, you know, they're certainly not saying making, making up things out of, out of, out of the air. There's a really great uh, edition of Mein Kampf actually that I would encourage people to get if they have, uh, if, they, if they know German, uh, the Weimar, uh, the, the state of Weimar has put out uh, an entire two volume, huge two volume uh, edition of, of Mein Kampf, the first version published in Germany since the war. And it goes all the way through Mein Kampf and looks at every single claim Hitler makes and checks him on it. And yeah, he he sometimes will get stuff half right, but he always question, he always mentions half of what's there. And they show like, no, he mentions this newspaper article, but the newspaper article doesn't actually say that. He's manipulating it to get it to agree with what he wants. Mm. So the 
the systematic bending of the truth uh, is uh, is a is a very powerful technique. But um, again, I don't want to deal in, in half truths and manipulated truths. I want to deal with evidence and and leave go where the evidence actually leads us, as opposed to there's a cult of devil worshippers. Let me find evidence for that. <laughs> Uh, or, you know, white people from Atlantis made civilization. Let me go find right. ev evidence of that. <laughs> um, so um, yeah. that's not scientific. That's not how that's not how we approach things from a scientific point of view. Um, we let the evidence build up our theories. We don't take a theory, then go looking for evidence. Um, that's a great point. I love that about you. That's why I was so drawn to you. I think you were drawn back. We both we mutually were drawn to each other for this whole reason. Um, and And that's what we need in light of all the crazy stuff that goes on out there, we need this. So as far as the satanic panic goes, would you say that it has ended? I think it's morphed. Um, the satanic panic relies on uh, mythological tropes that go back to the middle ages, sort of anti-Semitic tropes that go back to the middle ages. Um, and even some of these tropes that go back to the uh, anti cathar uh, crusades of the, of the 13th century. So I would say that because those, mythological tropes are just so baked into Western civilization, they don't end, they just sort of mutate through time. The satanic panic is a mutation of the, of the of earlier panics that occurred, like the witch panics of the early modern period. And so I would say that what's happened is primarily it's mutated again, and the mutation that's currently, um, that's currently around is, is QAnon. Uh, QAnon is the, is the current version of that mutation, which is still a version of the idea that elite Satanists, globalists are are uh, are in the, in, engaged in child some kind of somehow uh, large scale child abuse in the interest of draining their adrenochrome, which again is a, just a version of the blood libel, uh, the idea that Jews secretly murdered children in order to use their blood mm. for matzah or other kinds of things. So it's the exact same story with just a new twist and a new spin. Um, so, and also I would say that half the time they're talking about globalist, it's just really anti-Semitism. Um, you know, the amount of time is it's so it's the, it's the globalists or it's Soros. I'm like, just come out and say that you're a Nazi. <laughs> like, um, wow. just, just, uh, let's not beat around the bush around this. Um, and again, you look at some of the claims made about this and during the satanic panic, um, you get these enormously bizarre claims like Dungeons and Dragons calls kids to become Satanists and kill each other or commit suicide. God forbid there's no evidence for that. And there's evidence to the contrary role-playing games actually, um, foster pro, uh, cooperative behavior. Um, in fact, people who play role-playing games are actually contraindicated for criminal activity. <laughs> it's like literally the opposite of what they claimed. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure you remember the days where they said that there was all kinds of backwards talking and heavy metal music yep. that made people do stuff. Right. Um, and people forget that, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and, and, um, uh, and, uh, Judas Priest were both put on trial, uh, in the eighties and, and accused of in, intentionally putting subliminal messages in their records to get their <laughs> listeners to kill themselves. And they were, of course, both acquitted. Wow. Ozzy Osbourne and, and, I, uh, I and, didn't realize uh, it went that yeah. far. Oh yeah. They were, they were both put on trial, uh, sued by people. And of course, I mean, these are grieving families whose sons did hurt themselves, did, did attempt suicide or, and did commit suicide. And, and, you know, grieving parents are going to reach for whatever they can to make sense of what's just happened. And they had this ready made narrative that was invented by these, you know, these occult experts again, that, um, I don't know, that Stairway to Heaven has secret occult messages if you just play the record backwards. And of course, we call this pareidolia, right? If you if you think that there are secret satanic messages in something and you play something backwards, your brain will go looking for those messages and you will hear things, even if they're not there. Um, in the same way that you can see things in the clouds if you stare at them long enough. Um, so this is the kind of thing that you got through the 1980s. Um, and we laugh at it now, you know, yeah. that there are secret backwards messages and, and heavy metal music. Uh, but I'm, I can assure you that when Ozzy Osbourne was, you know, put on trial for it, um, fairly confident he was not laughing. No. And I mean, I, I'm not giggling <laughs> because of the seriousness. I'm giggling like how ridiculous, you it's, know, it's like so, it, it's, yeah, it's so, so insane. Yeah, it really it's so is bizarre. And it's but. just like we think we're modern and scientific and we're like above the superstition. And if anything, Michael Shermer's book, The Believing Brain and others have kind of pointed out, actually, we're more superstitious because we have so much mental capacity to think on these different levels. It's even worse. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we look for patterns, and when bad things happen, we really want to have a reason why the bad thing happened. And we like simple answers, and no matter how crazy they are, right? Uh, and a, a simple answer, why bad things are happening, is there's there's a global satanic conspiracy causing all the bad things to happen. And mm. uh, that's, a, that's a simple solution for what in the 1980s was a very, were, were a lot of very complicated social problems. Um, and so we get this kind of thing that goes on with, with the satanic panic ditto in the middle ages, right? You had a, a, you have a lot of, you have the breakdown of the feudal social order and for the elites at the time, they really didn't like that. They didn't like feudalism was coming to an end. So they needed something to explain why their world was coming to an end. Well, it was witches, right? And, 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 and 60,000 women died. Um, yeah. yeah tor- you know, um, so this is the reason why. Now, these kinds of conspiracy theories can be so dangerous because, I mean, again, you look at the Middle Ages, um, you know, the Nazi conspiracy theories that the Jews controlled the world and things like that led to the deaths of millions of people. So these conspiracy theories, um, QAnon and other things like this can be, they can be lethal. Um, they're not just sort of kooky, weird internet people. They truly can be, they can be socially lethal. I think it's dangerous. Yeah, what you're describing here. And in fact, I feel like I'm doing the Lord's work in all of this. I really do. Um, like, I really believe in what you're doing and what I'm doing here is going to help change a lot of people. And I hope it becomes more viral and mainstream where people are thinking with critical thinking skills and such. You, I, I emailed you because I was excited. I said, hey, check it out. Look what I'm doing. I'm having an, mm-hmm. an expert coming to give a presentation to debunk the Kaiser myth. Like the yeah. idea, you know, cause that's all filtered into this whole thing that you're describing about rulers. And they're not like, if, if, if Jews aren't the rulers, then technically, well, we don't even know if they really are Jews. They're all Europeans. And it's just a bunch of uh, nonsense that I'm, I'm interested in debunking. So, oh yeah. I mean, I get, I get the Khazar stuff constantly in my channel. I'm, you know, people tell me things like, Oh, anti-Semitism isn't really around anymore. And I'm like, let me show you the amount of, <laughs> stuff i have to delete from the comments on my channel uh on a on a weekly daily basis right uh i'm like no you're you're delusional if you think that anti-semitism has, has gone away it's it's taken other forms but it's certainly not uh certainly not gone away um and again i think that's the first conspiracy theory the idea that jews as a group of people are somehow responsible for the execution of jesus um and therefore they're corporately responsible because of that line of matthew right let his blood be upon our hands and the hands of our children and therefore jews as a population could be targeted um for all the bad things that were happening in in europe and you see that idea play itself out in the middle ages uh again in in very lethal very lethal ways Mm. real quick here super chat from claus thank you so much for the super chat my friend i really appreciate it how does it feel to have satan off your back got to feel good what is your favorite heavy metal song i don't know man what's your favorite heavy metal song heavy metal when i'm when i think of heavy i'm thinking like extremely heavy Mm -hmm. um and i would probably place that in either slipknot or mudvayne um i like dig dig always grabbed my attention i i also like some of slipknot um but I, I don't know if I could like put one song. Yeah, it's hard, right? It is hard, but it, that's heavy. Like, and that's almost like the furthest heavy, I guess. Well, there is deeper. Don't get me wrong. Right. You can't yeah, I listen, I listen, yeah, I listen. Yeah. Right. Cookie Monster music. Right. Um, yeah, I listen to a lot of, of black metal, but I have to say that I, I mean, the song that always comes to my mind is Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath. Every single metal song is ultimately derivative of black. You can like, you can find every other heavy metal song in utero somewhere inside of the song black Sabbath by black Sabbath. So I always tell people it's sort of like the, the cue source of, uh, of, of black metal or any kind of metal music. So I don't know if it's my favorite, but I think it's the most Im- important. So I would say that probably black Sabbath by black Sabbath. Although these days I'm mostly more of a black metal, um, fan. I think maybe my favorite black metal song would be I'll lay my bones down by among the rocks and roots by wolves in the throne room. Nice like 14 minute long masterpiece. Uh, so I do like Tool. Someone brought up Tool and, and I love Schism. Tool Schism is one of my favorite because it's just so poetic. It's almost yeah. like another Metallica one or um, a Hotel California by the Beatles kind of feel to me. Tool has this kind of a experience that you get when you listen to it. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I love Tool too. I, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of Tool fans. I don't. I, I think I, I think the joke I always tell <laughs> is that I would I would love to go to a Tool concert if it were only populated by Taylor Swift fans. 
Right. Um, yeah. So. Klaus says Cookie Monster music. LOL. <laughs> Thank you so much for the uh, super chat asking a really uh, funny question. Good, fun question, actually. Um, as far as the Satanic Panic goes, this is this was a very hot thing. Was there anything during the time this became viral that was another conspiracy theory that was kind of simultaneously existing, almost like COVID 19s first, uh, the first virus, you know, vaccine covers its first, but there's there's kind of spinoffs that have come from it. Is there anything like that as far as the satanic panic goes? I mean, it sort of swallowed up a lot of other uh, conspiracy theories, you know. So the the for instance the, the heavy metal stuff right it was kind of brought into the panic and the dungeons and dragon stuff was brought into the panic and kind of linked with it so it was kind of the great vacuum cleaner of uh of panics it would just suck everything else in like so for instance the panic around drugs was vacuumed in and so lsd was this way of satanists getting people to you know trip and see the devil or whatever so it sort of it really vacuumed up a lot of other conspiracy theories uh at the time um I will say that what is what is interesting about um, the satanic panic conspiracy theory is that the the way that a lot of these therapists were using psycho psychoanalysis and psycho uh, psych, psychiatry or whatever to recover lost memories. I love this, by the way. Go that ahead. that stuff was actually pioneered in the UFO craze of the 1960s and 70s, and so many people who were uh, abducted by UFOs, right? Uh, which again, a lot of that UFO stuff is just rehashing of like seeing angels and demons and having demons come and possess people and things like that. It's the same kind of structural stuff that's finding a new route, not in religion anymore, but in things like science fiction. Uh, and you can track this when, a, when an alien appears on television, when people get abducted by an alien, the aliens start to look like the ones they just saw on TV. Hmm. This happens over and over and over again on the outer limits and things like that. But that technique of recovering lost memories, which is now completely discredited, they were implanting memories, which we do now know Im memory implantation is a thing that you can do. They weren't recovering lost memories. They were implanting them and uh, through hypnosis and other things. And that process was beta tested in a really sure way in the UFO movement a decade or two before the panic. And so in an interesting way, the UFO craze of the 60s and 70s really laid the, the foundations in many ways for the kinds of techniques that will be used to fuel the reality of the satanic panic through this recovered memory stuff. Now that all that recovered memory stuff is debunked. Uh, it, you cannot, that has all been uh, debunked on lots of levels. But again, th there's a thread that goes through this stuff. And the thread is credulity, right? It's when we simply accept what people say, or we go looking for what we want to believe. People got abducted by aliens, or there's a satanic conspiracy or, or whatever. When you want to believe something, and Caesar said this, men gladly believe in the things they wish for. When you want to believe something, you will find it. Mm -hmm. And you will develop techniques to find it. And if you get famous for it, then you have to double down on it. You can't ever come back and publish a book and saying, oh, yeah, that stuff was all wrong. You have to, you're, you're, you're locked into it. And so, again, with this UFO, this UFO stuff, which I don't really believe that there have ever been UFO or I don't believe that aliens have ever visited here, much less kidnapped people for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Um, but it doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. What matters is it was a huge social phenomena of which one aspect of it was important for underwriting the panic. So they are linked together. They're linked together in a weird way. They're linked together in this way of, of, of memory recovery, which we now know is, is a total bunk thing. Um, and uh, I think that the psychi psychologists who practice it can be disbarred. They can be basically thrown out of the APA. Um, <clears throat> because, again, we know that it doesn't recover memories. What we know is it implants them. And you can have implanted memories, and you could pass a lie detector. I'm fairly confident that the people who recovered those memories of being victims of, satanic, of the satanic ritual abuse, I'm fairly confident that if you put them on a lie detector, they'd pass. Not because it happened, but because they believe. they believe it did. So it doesn't affect their, yeah. their, there's no reaction that's making it look like you're right. being suspicious. You know, it's really interesting you say that. And I was reminded, this is why I'm glad you brought this back up. You've mentioned this a couple of times. I never, I was reminded by it and then I forgot. We started rabbit trailing into the conversation. This guy right here, okay, the, he is the claimed Australian Jesus that I interviewed, right? Not many mm. people had this opportunity to be able to talk to him, especially atheists. But I talked to this guy, A.J. Miller, with Robert Price and uh, my good friend, uh, David, who's in Australia. This guy right here claims to be Jesus. 
And I've actually spoken to his wife who's terrified of him and the power because he has money, Mm -hmm. uh, because he has all these cult members, um, of trying to ruin her relationship with her son that, you know, he might try to win custody in Australia. Like there's all sorts of crazy stuff. But uh, when I talked to her, and this is back in the eighties, I think it was when they were together, they were married for many years. They brought in one of their friends. They were part of the Jehovah's witnesses. He was an elder and he had like psychological problems. And I guess he had went to a psychiatrist long story short. He had all these memories of like, satanic things when he was a young kid and then also was telling these women that they also like that when they were younger that they had these satanic things done to to them Mm -hmm. and uh they had to believe that well it becomes something of a memory issue when he finally goes and by the way i remember being jesus and being crucified in the first century he literally believes in his memory somehow from his past life of being Jesus. And his girl now, this his wife, who they call Mary, was Mary Magdalene, his wife from the first century. This is like – these people really believe this nonsense, right? And there's a whole cult of followers. One of these people uh, is Cornelius. He claims to be remember being <laughs> Cornelius. Like I'm not joking. So this a whole cast of characters. This false memory stuff that spun into the satanic panic, you could see both of them in the story of A.J. Miller. And I want to interview his wife, and she's terrified to come on and actually talk about it. But I've talked to her in private on the phone, and she said he would tell us that we were you know, affected by Satanists and molested and raped by mm-hmm. Satanists, all this crazy stuff. And then – turn around and talk about memories from being the first century Jew named Jesus and all this stuff. And um, I found this out after interviewing the guy, but there's both the false memory nonsense combined with the satanic panic all in one right in this guy's life. So it's interesting you brought that up. No, right. And of course he discovers this stuff in the eighties when the panic was raging and when all this false memory stuff was, was, was going on. Yeah. It's, this is a, um, and of course that dovetails also with like past life regression and stuff like that, where people think that they can, you know, they can go back to their past lives and figure out things. And I always like the fact that all these people think they're Joan of Arc. And I'm like, <laughs> mathematically, that can't be a thing. Uh, it can't all be Joan of Arc. Uh, right? Maybe someone was, but, um, but yeah, this, this memory implanted stuff um, uh, really, again, destroy people's lives. And what's terrifying about it, there are support groups out there now for people who were victimized by psychologists who did uh, memory regression. And they told them that they had experienced all this stuff because obviously it's very traumatizing to be told that you were the victim of all these horrifying things and you believe it, right? You come to believe it and therefore you actually go undergo the trauma of it, ha- of some level of it happening to you, at least psychologically. And what ends up happening at the end of all this is that now there are people in uh, support groups who have through the 1980s and 90s were told all this stuff. It deeply traumatized them. And now as kids, you know, they're being told this stuff sometimes at six and seven. And now they're having to deal with the with the with the, the long term effects of it. So, um, and again, this is the kind of thing that the psychological, the professional psychological association uh, has only just now come to terms with um, the fact that in the 1980s they pumped this stuff out. There were academic conferences. This is a place where uh, academics were falling susceptible to this stuff, and the academics that were wanting to come out and say this is crazy, that like, you guys are this is not happening. We need to roll this back. We need to pump the brakes on this. They were shouted down because that was, how could all these people be wrong? Hmm. Again, it, it doesn't matter how many people are telling you something. It doesn't make it right. What makes it right is evidence. And the psychologists were saying, oh, we must believe these people. We must believe victims when they tell us what's going on, as opposed to saying, look, if you had six kids and these kids were sacrificed to the devil, you would show biological signs of having been pregnant, of having had kids. There's no biological evidence of this. Mm. So what, you know, so again, the, the, what's important part of all this, right? What's important in all this is we have to take a multitude of, of evidences and then look at the preponderance of evidence. Because if you look at one data point, you can always find weird data points. Mm -hmm. The question is, what does the preponderance of evidence tell us? And if the preponderance of evidence tells us, yeah, this person is testifying to a very strange thing. Let's go look for evidence of it. Where did the where did these satanic where did these rituals happen? Take us to the place in the woods where it happened. You know, wear a bug and talk to the old Satanists or something, right? Like, 
give us some evidence for this. Yeah. And the problem, of course, is that no evidence was ever was ever forthcoming. And that's not because people weren't looking for it. There are true believers out there today who desperately want to believe for whatever reason the satanic panic was real and they hire bulldozers to go dig up old daycare centers looking for tunnels underneath them because kids said that there were secret tunnels beneath daycares where they were uh, assaulted and they're still out there digging up you know parking lots looking for tunnels and they're not there that's wild um something that came to mind let me get this super chat real quick here uh, Anubis Fire, thank you so much for that super chat. I really appreciate the support. Satanic panics seem to stem from Protestant resurges. Hmm. Thanks, guys. So one of the things that is worth mentioning um, the in the in, during the panic is the rise of the moral majority. Folks from the 1980s. Uh, again, I was born in 81, so I don't remember a lot of this. But this is also the same time period where the moral majority um, and Pat Robinson and those kinds of people were really making a huge push into politics. And one of their arguments was that the world was about to end. And this is a period where Satan is going to be the most active. And therefore, again, it dovetailed with the panic, right? That um, we as Christians need to become mobilized in politics because Satan is getting so powerful now. And there's been a decline in Christianity in the 60s and 70s. We need to reclaim America as a Christian country which you still hear people say. Um, and so it dovetails with that kind of Protestantism. Although I will say that in general, the satanic panic wasn't a big deal in the Catholic church. That is to say, um, um, the Catholic church was not so, it was, it was more immune to the panic. And part of the reason why is because the Catholic church has a very, a really thick hierarchy. And if you make claims about you know, you being a devil worshiper, they're going to investigate it. They have actually investigative bodies to figure that stuff out. Whereas in uh, local Protestant churches, there's no central authority. And so individual churches can kind of go on sprees. Mm -hmm. um, and so in general, the Catholic church was more immune to the panic, but of course the Catholic church was also dealing with their own problems in the 1980s with this widespread uh, pedophilia stuff where they just were shuffling pedophiles around the church and, 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 um, and not doing that. Now, I'm not saying there weren't people abusing children, and I'm not saying there weren't people trying to be devil worshipers or occultists. Not that occultists are all devil worshipers. What I'm saying is there wasn't a conspiracy of these things, right? The church, certainly, children got uh, molested. It's like they're, you know, unfortunately being molested now. Right. The question is who was doing it, and the issue wasn't what who was doing it and who's not doing it. Folks, I'm sure know this. The the um, when children are abused, the most likely abuser is a family member, not a random stranger danger person, and certainly not a vast occult group of Satanists. So, uh, yeah, the question is, where does this stuff come from? And of course, children are being abused. That happens at all times and all places. What wasn't happening was that it, it wasn't the result of a widespread satanic um Conspiracy. satanic cabal or something yeah. so so th this brings us back to your personal experience with the guy from your high school and i don't if you're not comfortable you know going into anything just feel free to let me know but as far as this guy when they when they finally pulled the evidence out what did they determine about him i mean was he just not right mentally and was murdering people i mean was he a serial killer what what was this all about and then how did that how did they disconnect once they investigated this that from the satanic panic so it's a good question. So it, it appears that um, there were two layers of what happened. One layer is he, he killed his mother and he killed his ex-girlfriend and her, one of her friends. And then he shot randomly into, into the school where I was. And the, the, when you look at his first confession, there's no mention of any occult stuff at all. And then he gets these lawyers and then all of a sudden all this occult stuff comes out. It basically had the devil made me do it kind of defense, right? Mm -hmm. Which were, those defenses happened in the 1980s. Um, and what we, we, what we get is we get this story that he begins to dabble with the occult and somehow that's tied to these murders. But what ends up happening is that as the trial goes forward, as the trials go forward, all of that stuff basically gets, gets dumped. Um, and the charges get dropped and the charges get dropped and the charges get dropped until eventually this question sort of lingers. What role was any of this devil worship playing in, in any of this? And when you look at the preponderance of evidence, it doesn't seem like in, much, if anything at all. In fact, one of the more interesting things about it is that uh, when all of us were in, were arrested and put in jail that first night, 
uh, we had to introduce ourselves to each other because most of us didn't even know each other. Now, it's really hard to be in a conspiracy with people you don't know. But that's the sort of first sign we were like, this is something's really crazy here. And then the police started, you know, interviewing people and they realized, like, these guys don't even know each other. Like, what's happening here? And it's hard to put together a satanic conspiracy of people who don't know each other. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first major chink in the chain that said, oh, this is just crazy. Right. This this stuff is not actually uh, not actually real. And it took it took a year and a half before because, you know, once police charge you with a crime, they really want it to be true because otherwise they look really bad when they have to drop a bunch of charges. Um, it took about a year and a half for it to eventually go completely away, uh, aside from the, the, the young man that did the actual killing. He obviously mm-hmm. was sentenced to life in prison. Um, but what's fascinating about that about that process is that um, they held on as long as they could until basically a judge was like, you have to put forward some evidence. And when the, by the end of it, what we found out was that the the guy that actually did the killing um, in one of his subsequent confessions was like, there's no, these guys aren't involved in this. He even said they're not involved in this and they hid the evidence. Go figure. Right. Because, you know, this is, I mean, literally if we went on trial, we just called him to the witness stand and be like, Hey, was there a conspiracy of Satanists? He was no, not even the end of it. And so it took that. Right. It took that uh, for them to finally drop these charges. And and I will say this, right, like, yes, it, it did have a negative impact on my life. But who I really feel for are the victims of this, right, the real victims who are the family members of people that were killed because they were told a story that wasn't true about what happened to their family members that I can't as a you know, we're both parents, like mm-hmm. the idea that your kid getting hurt in school just is. Bro, I'm kicking doors in if uh, I mean, like I am going to hurt. Yeah, it's just it's an unimaginable tragedy. Yeah. But, and just imagine that unimaginable tragedy happening where your child is killed at school and then being told a satanic conspiracy is responsible for it only for no evidence to ever be put forward. And then the charges all be dropped. It must have just felt like a kick in the gut to the families of these of these poor young women and poor people who were hurt that day and, and killed. And that's who I really feel most terrible for like it obviously had a bad impact on me but you know i can't imagine what it must have been like the emotional roller coaster of being told oh yeah cult killed your children and then being like oh yeah we're gonna drop all the charges we don't have any evidence i mean it's just it, there's a degree of irresponsibility on the part of of the police and prosecution that i find to be especially grotesque and agree i'm with you with you with you 100 yeah. percent, yeah that that really um lowers the faith right someone has in the justice system especially when the system does that um and the, and the same thing with the same thing with the west memphis three right these strong these three guys were arrested and charged and, and convicted of killing these three boys they were all eventually set free what that tells us is there was no evidence they did it they arrested innocent guys and they let the guys whoever did it off the people that killed those boys are out there somewhere that's a huge miscarriage of justice when mm. innocent people are convicted in the guilty walk and and all under the guise of satanic conspiracy theories. That's wild. I'm glad you brought that one up as well to kind of remind people the, your involvement. Do you think, why did they involve you? Were you part of like a, 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 a dungeons and dragons group? Like what was your, why would they look at you and go, ah, he's suspect for Satan. Yeah. So, I mean, the guy did drop papers to me in front before he started killing people. He did ask me to take some papers and give them to a shared friend of ours. And I noticed on the top of them that one of them was a a, a will. Like, I was like, this guy wants to, he's going to die. Like he, and it mentioned murder and stuff. And it instantly told me something was badly wrong. And yeah, you know, I played Dungeons and Dragons. I like read weird stuff in high school, you know, uh, you know, like read weird alchemy books and Latin and stuff. But again, I wasn't like a the ex, I, you know I wasn't I w- I didn't look like a beard or whatever. But you know I it was the case that on the one hand, I did do I did have weird interests, right? Mm-hmm. But I still do. I, I still do. <laughs> They've never gone away. But um, but one of my best friends was like a cheerleader. Like I hung out with like jocks and stuff sometimes. Like I, you know, when you when you when you look when you look at the actual situation. They try to be like, oh, Sledge was an outcast and he wore a black trench coat and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I don't own a black trench coat. I wear 
like a nine Chanel's t-shirt. And one of my friends is like a cheerleader. Like what kind of outcast is that? Yeah. Like you need to get your story straight. Like either I'm an outcast weirdo or I'm not like, which one is it? And again, the story, they, they would, they would tell a story and it wouldn't make any sense. And they would tell another story and they would tell another story. And these stories eventually got ramped up to the point where, you know, these guys are involved in, in devil worship, which is a bit hilarious considering that, you know, like at the same time they were accusing me of devil worship, I was at the synagogue learning Hebrew and like Judaism doesn't even have a devil. Like, like this does, the story doesn't make sense. Right. And so, um, ultimately what ends up happening is that, uh, they had to, uh, they had to let, they had to, the charges are all dropped and, um, not as much as an apology, not as much as a, sorry about that. Right. So. I'm, I was thinking of this guy right here, uh, just to give people an idea. He was a, a, a serial killer, um, Richard Ramirez, yeah. uh, for those who've never seen him and supposedly a Satanist in, uh, and did he play any role that, you know, of historically in the satanic panic? Yeah, so there, there's a group of, um, and you can also see uh, a, guy, a fellow named Pazuzu in there too, who was also a serial killer. Mo mo most scholars actually refer to those guys are as pseudo Satanists. They learn about Satanism from movies, or they learn about Satanism from uh, daytime talk shows, and they imitate it. Um, so you know, actual Satanism, as founded by Anton Lavey, is an atheistic religious movement that has uh, that doesn't believe in God or Satan at all. Actually, it's a it's a hedonistic uh, uh, belief system that doesn't actually involve belief in any gods. And so most of the guys that committed these crimes who alleged that they were Satanists, uh, most scholars refer to them as pseudo Satanists because they're sort of aping what they see on TV. Mm -hmm. um, because again, there were never any actual Satanists for them to learn from. They had to pick it up from somewhere. And most of where they picked it up from was, was uh, movies and stuff. And so again, if you see that famous image of Richard Ramirez having the, the pentagram in his hand, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's taking that from the the Church of Satan. Yeah, that that the third image to the left there on the bottom. I'm, um, I'm gonna pop it in here just to show yeah. people. So again, he's taking that image from the the, the Church of Satan founded by Anton Lavey uh, in the late '70s, and that the Church of Satan, of course, was again a, a um, an atheistic um, organization, mostly for theatrics. Anton Lavey was a carny um, who was uh, used his uh, skills as a as a carny. To basically uh, make a a kind of uh, a kind of uh, uh, what's the great word a showman religion, and that showman religion became very popular among some Hollywood people and things like that. And it's still quite popular. So um, so yeah, again, um, they claim to be Satanists, but when you get when you begin to actually ask them, what does that constitute? Where did you learn Satanism? Um, most of them learned it from from movies and television shows. So again, like I said, most folks refer to that as pseudo Satanism. I, I figure I wonder if that played any role in light of what was going on with the satanic panic. Oh, it certainly amped it up. I mean, when you have the son of Sam or other people saying that they were part of a satanic organization or even Jeffrey Dahmer setting up a weird altar or whatever, um, it played into it, right? It was grist for the mill of the people who were like, told you, right? But then you try to connect Richard Ramirez or Jeffrey Dahmer or the son of Sam to a larger you know, uh, a larger cult and it doesn't, it doesn't work. Right. Much less to, I don't know, black Sabbath or Led Zeppelin or, or whatever. Um, and there's Jeff, um, who's, I think the second biggest Netflix show right now. That's what I was, uh, I was going to bring it up because of its popularity right now. It's like, yeah, I started watching it and it was getting nighttime and look, I don't believe in the boogeyman, but I also, my anxiety, I couldn't handle watching how that show built up mm. the, the neighbor smoking a cigarette, listening to some grinding noises where he's using the drill and there's blood dripping down and there's a skull or a head in the fridge. And like, I'm just sitting here going, Oh my gosh, you know, but I imagine this would have played right into the satanic panic. Of course, this is of course in the early nineties. I mean, and again, I don't believe in the boogeyman either, but I do believe in Jeffrey Dahmer and we don't, you right. Know, I don't, I don't. Uh, I don't need a boogeyman um, <laughs> when we have people like that. With people like that out there, and I think the FBI says that there are a hundred or so serial killers active at any at any moment, which is a terrifying wow. uh, thing to conjure. But again, Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, the son of Sam, these were profoundly disturbed people, but they weren't part of a larger uh, satanic conspiracy. It's very important to separate between 
people who claim to be Satanists and who, who do crimes as opposed to the idea that they're part of a larger network or cabal of, of, uh, of Satanists of which there've been, there's been uh, no actual evidence uh, for that. Thank and, you, you for know, that. Or Jeffrey Dahl or Char Charles, uh, Charles Manson or whatever. Yeah. 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 And they, they, I think he tried to play into something of course as well. And he's, yeah. yeah Char Charlie Manson had all kinds of things. He had all kinds of screws loose. Yeah. Uh, Native uh, Kravitz, thank you for the or Kravitz, thank you for the super chat. Any recs for how to address or prevent these panics? Yeah, Nadav, that's a great question. Um, if folks want to really read a really great book about this, um, um, uh, you may want to pull this up if you don't mind. Uh, there's a yeah. great book called Satanic Panic. Um, let me find uh, the author's name real fast. It's Jeffrey something. It's slipping my mind. Um, you can pull it up on. Amazon or whatever place you buy your books. Um, well, let me get his right. name. Uh, Jeffrey S. Victor. Yep, Jeffrey S. Victor. Yep. So th there's a great book called uh, Satanic Panic. This is the best study of the panic you can get. Um, at the end of his book, the very last chapter is precisely what you asked for, uh, Nadav. It is a uh, detailed step by step guide for media, law enforcement, religious leaders, and civic leaders about what to do if a panic like this begins to emerge. And it is a step-by-step -step guide, how to get in front of a rumor, how to encourage crowds of people to think critically as opposed to and give in to rumors, how to separate, how to tell experts from non-experts when it comes to uh, satanic panics, how to, uh, how to stop the spread of rumors, right, through transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Victor is a sociologist. And so what's really great about his study here is he studies it not just from a historical point of view, but he also studies it from a sociological point of view in terms of who believes this kind of thing? Who's more likely to believe it? How do they spread? If mm. they spread, how do they, what kicks them off? What makes them go away? So he gives a very, really insightful, deep dive into understanding them as a sociologist, as a societal, uh, like a mental virus. And the question is, how do you stop a mental virus? You quarantine it. Right, you expose it to things that will like get rid of it, and so he approaches it that way. And at the very end of his book, which I'm, there's not an automatic uh, thing where you can see the book here, unfortunately, but at the end of his book, he he has uh, a, about a ten page chapter, kind of step by step going through uh, the entire process of what to do if a panic like this begins to emerge in your community. And I think it, um, the advice that he offers is is very, very, very sound, very sound advice. Wow, I'm trying to zoom in. He says on the back here, again and again, we are told by journalists, police, and fundamentalists that there exists a secret network of, of criminal fanatics, worshipers of Satan, who are responsible for kidnapping, human sacrifice, sexual abuse, and torture of children, drug dealing, mutilation of animals, desecration of churches and cemeteries, pornography, heavy metal lyrics, <laughs> and cannibalism. This popular tale is almost entirely without foundation, but the legend continues to gather momentum in the teeth of evidence and good sense networks of children, uh, child advocates, credulous uh, or self-serving social workers, instant expert police officers, and unscrupulous ministers of religion help to spread the panic along with fabricated survivors, memoirs, um, passed off as true accounts and irresponsible broadcast investigations, a classic witch hunt, which you bring up medieval witch hunt stuff, comparable to those of medieval... Oh. I should have just kept reading is underway in innocent victims are smeared and railroaded satanic panic uncovers the truth behind the satanic cult hysteria and exposes the roots of this malignant mythology showing in detail how unsam unsubstantiated rumor becomes transformed into publicly accepted fact. So it, it goes on. Of course, this is right. really, ooh. It's a great book. I really, I said, I really would highly recommend it. And, it, and for me, I will say that reading it uh, was really cathartic. You know, when bad things happen to you, just like I said earlier, when bad things happen to people, people want a reason for it. And it's hard to believe a random bad thing happened to you. And sometimes that happens, but sometimes there is a reason why there is a, there is a larger story. And when I read the book uh, many years ago, um, I remember thinking to myself, oh yeah, like what happened to me happened to hundreds of people, thousands of people. Mm -hmm. from you know kids listening to heavy metal who were like kicked out of their schools or kids playing the dungeons and dragons that were like hounded by religious fundamentalists and made fun of or people who got picked on for being weird or being goth or whatever or people just being accused of being devil worshipers because they just didn't believe in christianity or whatever right this really 
like hurt a lot of people, right? It, it, it mentally harmed thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. And I think that by looking at the panic and really understanding what happened, uh, we can take advice like the one that, that Jeffrey Victor gives. And um, it's the kind of thing that as a religious studies scholar, you know, if I were ever called in um, on a case where it involved the occult or whatever, I would want to be the person who would really take Victor's book with me and say, these are step by step the kind of things we need to do to make sure this does not become a panic. Because what matters is justice and what matters is due process. What doesn't, what, what we shouldn't give into are myths and uh, crowd mentalities. You know, Nietzsche famously said that insanity in individuals is rare, but insanity in crowds is the rule. And so I think it's important to note that, yeah, individual people might not believe in this, but once you get a crowd of people together, the rumor spreads really quickly and can cause a, a lot of harm. I love that. That's, that's powerful. That's a way to end off on this because I, I, I literally, I think that uh, you can see patterns of people connecting dots that aren't there mm -hmm. and we being pattern seeking creatures and also in our past, we connect dots that weren't there. We had no empirical data to connect them, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Those, that's just how we survived. And with what you're talking about here, like for example, uh, Dahmer connecting homosexuality to serial killing. It's like, no, like, like what, the, where's that connection? Of course, um, right. the guy's well, nuts. The guy's the, not right. And the same thing happened in the panic, by the way. Um, in Ohio, uh, a public official, I think the head of the police came out and said that uh, the majority of Satanists are homosexuals. And of course, this is already a time period in the eighties where, where gay people are suffering from the effects of the AIDS epidemic. So they're mm -hmm. already dealing with a horrifying situation there, but then to also be looped into the idea that because you're gay, you're now susceptible to being accused of being a Satanist right? to make their life even harder. And so, again, this is a place where gay people already had a hard enough time in the 80s, right? And then you come out and say, oh, yeah, it's also their devil worshippers. Like, so this is a kind of thing where um, anyone who doesn't fit the mold can get vacuumed up into this, into this conspiracy theory. I think what you're doing is fantastic, Dr. Sledge, and I hope more people will go subscribe and support you through your Patreon. What do you offer on your Patreon? And let me pull that up. I can't <clears> believe I didn't pull that up to begin with. Yeah, I think the big thing I offer to my Patreon is that, you know, a community of people who are pretty academically interested in, in the study of uh, esotericism and the occult, again, from a, an academic point of view. And, um, you know, we hang out, we have like sort of, you know, sec no, secret, uh, we have uh, patron only um, and hangouts and, and things like that. So it's really a great opportunity to kind of uh, not just have me talk at you through a screen, but also for us to be able to talk together and uh especially if you're interested in a very specific thing in esotericism, the occult, it's also a chance for me to be able to say, this is really good information. It's really bad information. You know, let's take a look at this kind of stuff. Isn't it let's... under esoterica? Esoterica channel. I think someone took esoterica before me. I was about to say like, something's not adding up here. There we go. Okay. Let me share that for people. So yeah, you, so you do hangouts and chat with your uh, supporters. And yeah. And folks get early access to things. So the episode coming out this week actually is on the witch trials. You know, Ooh. we're in spooky times. So uh, you talking about the Salem witch trials? No, it's gonna, It's actually on a book from um, 1489. It's really the first book that really depicts witches for the first time. And so if you've ever seen an image of a witch, almost every image of a witch or witchcraft uh, is actually derivative of this one book called uh, De Lamiis et Phytonicis Moleribus, published uh, in 1489 by Ulrich Maleter. It's a little-known book. Uh, most people know uh, the bigger book, the uh, Malleus Maleficarum, the Hammer of Witches. But this other book probably had was actually more popular, at least in the time, and had illustrations, which everyone loves pictures. And so uh, we'll do a deep dive into um, this incredibly influential text in the history of the of the witch hunts and um, and the woodcuts that accompany it, because basically uh, all images we have of witches are somehow derivative of these six woodcuts, uh, first published in uh, in 1489. So it's a huge text. So that'll be content for Friday, and folks can check it out early if they want to hop on the Patreon. Go check it out. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the Salem witch trials. Just wondering if there was an impact from previous witch 
ideas. Yeah, um, yeah. The you know the the trials of 1693 are a big deal. But you know there was another trial that lasted even longer. Um, it didn't kill as many people, but it lasted even longer. And that was the Connecticut witch trials, which no one talks about. Wow. Uh, the Connecticut witch trials happened earlier, and uh, also there were the Bermuda witch trials, which no one ever talks about either. So there were three sets of witch trials that happened in, in North America, the, the Salem, the Connecticut, and the Bermuda trials. But for whatever reason, there's reasons, but the Salem trials get all the attention, whereas the, uh, the Connecticut trials, which, by the way, none of the people that were convicted and killed in Connecticut have ever been pardoned by the state of Connecticut. And that's the thing I want to start pushing for, that all those people should be pardoned in the same way that the, the victims of the Salem trials were all pardoned. Wow, that's wild that they still have that remnant there left. Yep. Go check out Dr. Sledge's website, justinsledge.com. Also, he has the YouTube. Where was it? I had it somewhere. Anyway, let me get that up here. Um, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. He is doing fantastic work, and he is educating people like no other. Um, this is a scholarly channel that gives you very good niche information, which if you're a strange weirdo, like we are, mm -hmm. you're going to get into it. The most like the viral one you had that you just launched is on Mary Magdalene's secret teachings, which is going viral right now on YouTube, which is awesome. You get into the Enochian stuff and Plato and, and, and Philo and you just everything. Like, honestly, uh, you go all over the place and, and I really do appreciate having you join me on Myth Vision. Um, I just want to give a little plug here for our Patreon as well. Go ahead and join us now. You'll access a lot of scholarly in-person interviews I've done with many academics, Elaine Pagels, Joel Baden, John J. Collins, Joshua Bowen, of course, recently, Paula Fredrickson. I've got James Tabor in-person interviews that I haven't launched. There's a lot of stuff on the Patreon that you can access that you won't find on the internet. It's just not out there. So please help us out. Check out our courses also in the description if you're wanting to educate yourself. And don't forget to join his Patreon if you like what you heard here with Dr. Sledge. Go ahead and have a hangout. I mean, how often do you do the hangouts? Uh, usually once a month. Um, we get all the patrons together, or at least the folks that can make it and, and hang out. So yeah, it'd be great to have folks. We'll schedule one here soon for Halloween time. So. Right. If you want to join the secret cabal of Satanist, this is the way to. <laughs> this is of course. A, you know, it's you know, it's funny you say that because I have people join my Patreon because they really do believe that I have like, if you just secret pay knowledge. me money, I have secret knowledge and I can teach the magic powers. And I, and I have to tell them like, look, dude, <laughs> I'm happy to refund your money, but just because you give me ten bucks a month, I don't have any magic powers. I'm I'm sorry. I'm an academic, uh, not a sorcerer. So right. um, if you want academic knowledge of the esoteric and the occult, come hang out with me. But uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any secret Kabbalah witchcraft to uh, get you a girlfriend or anything. I don't I don't have it. That's that's exactly why they join. Now, <laughs> if you want to join Myth Visions, I have that kind of power. I'm yeah, just... join yeah, join Derek for that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I seriously appreciate you, Justin, every time. I also appreciate you for taking the hard questions and going into the hard topics, like the last one we dealt with, because we were dealing with Certain anti-Semites, if you will, people who are actually like haters, you could see the motivation, you could see the drive, and it's obvious when you start to investigate, like nothing you said was enough. So you're debunking horrible ideas and by simply pointing out, yes, there's bad, yes, there's ugly, even today. Um, but then you're also pointing out that not everybody thinks the same way within Judaism, for example, or any other place you might go. So let's get people educated because I feel like our best option is to get people to think critically before they believe. Right. You want to believe in something? Go for it. If it comforts you to think when I die, I'm going to heaven or I think there's life after this. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Educate yourself because – People will slam you with hell. And I have friends right now who message me on a day-to-day, -day, Dr. Sledge, who believe no matter what, it's stuck in their head that they're like afraid that they're going to hell forever. God's going to punish them the whole nine. And I'm like, yeah, the more you look into the mythology, you know, anyway. Yeah, I have friends of mine who say, look, I don't believe in uh, hell anymore, but my limbic system does. Yeah. You know, and uh, I have friends of mine like that who grew up in fundamentalist churches and things like that. So... Yeah, you know, I, I I don't have a lot of interest in criticizing, but I have a lot of interest in educating. And I think that um, our society flourishes, democracy flourishes when we reject conspiracy theories, we reject credulity, we think critically, and we mm -hmm. suspend judgment when we don't have enough information. 
because I don't know doesn't get people killed. Right. It you know, doesn't. I, it doesn't. I don't know, but I know and that gets people killed. That I is. Know. And so for me, it's uh, it's all about me just being, yeah, I don't know. Here's the data. Here's what we know for facts. And this mm -hmm. is what we can derive from that and being there for being very provisional and very honest about what we do and do not know. Right. Real quick here, just to address a few people in the chat. Derek is tough on anti-Semitism prior to his trip to Israel. Coincidence? Listen, I'm secretly meeting with the rulers of the world. You got to give me a break. Duh. Yeah. Hey, um, uh, ask them where my check is, by the way. I've been looking for my uh, global Jewish conspiracy theory check. Um, me too. I haven't got one yet either. It's yeah. Weird. You know, I, I need to, um, I, I really would love to love to give them that, get my, get my check for my being part of the vast Jewish cabal that controls everything. Exactly. No, I just honestly, when you weigh out the whole thing, addressing this idea, um, I hope this is sarcasm, but if it's not, that's kind of sad to me. Um, addressing this issue is like the more I look into it, the more I realize how ridiculous, just like the panic toward Jewish people, these ideas are. They blame Jews for the for Islam. They blame Jews for Christianity. They blame Jews, of course, for Judaism. And in fact, if you want to say Jews come from Judah, what I have found li listening to Andrew Tobolowsky and others is they've just kind of Judah took the Northern kingdom story and narrative because it's a much larger kingdom and inserted themselves into this narrative. Uh, when the more you learn, the less these ridiculous ideas about, you know, the cabal of rulers of the world and stuff becomes, that doesn't mean there aren't harmful modern uh, ideas that come from rabbis and stuff like that. Sure. There's all kinds of jackass evil rabbis. Absolutely. Um, they will gladly like, tell you that Gentiles are all evil and, yep. and, uh, all the stuff. I'm like, yeah, like, trust me. Like, yeah, there are all kinds of like bad actor rabbis. I, I don't like those guys either. Like, like this one right here. Look at this. The Kabbalah and the Zohar is hostile to Gentiles. Is it totally, or is that specific areas that you might find certain Jewish rabbis making sentiments like this? And do yeah. we know why they're saying this? Exactly. Yeah. What's the historical context? Why, you know, what, is it weird that Jewish people are are, are hostile to non-Jewish people in Spain in the 1300s? Right when they're being totally, yeah, persecuted, that, being persecuted, yeah. is that totally surprising? Uh, it doesn't justify it. It doesn't justify bigotry. But it, again, it says like, oh yeah, there's a historical context for this. Mm -hmm. And again, if modern Jewish people want to lean on a 13th century text to justify their anti-Gentile bigotry, well, they can just like they can just like screw off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I don't have any patience for that. I don't have any patience for, uh, for people using medieval books or ancient books as the way to justify their homophobia or bigotry. I don't care what kind of bigotry it is, whether it's anti Gentile bigotry or anti gay bigotry or, right. or whatever. You can't hide behind your scriptures as an excuse for, for being hateful. I just don't have any patience for it. That's why I love you, dude. I love learning from you and enjoying your time and just getting into this stuff because we, we ethically we're on the same page. We, we, we ultimately want the same things. And uh, yeah, I, I, I go join his Patreon, go subscribe to his YouTube channel and help support good scholarship. Any final words from you, Dr. Sledge to maybe encourage people or. Yeah, know? I would, I guess I would say when it comes to these conspiracy theories, whether they're, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories like, you know, some of uh, the, the chat seems to be indulging in are, uh, or whether they're conspiracy theories like QAnon or whatever. Um, I think that skepticism is a really healthy thing to cultivate. And skepticism doesn't mean not believing things. It means withholding belief until you have good evidence. It just says, I don't know. And so I would say that skepticism is all about the idea that one can say, I don't have enough evidence for this one way or the other, and I'm just going to withhold judgment about it. There's no moral, there's no moral compunction to believe or disbelieve anything. Mm -hmm. Withholding judgment, I think, is a very ethically sound thing to do. And admitting when you don't have enough evidence and saying I don't know is one of the most respectable things one can do. And we need to we need to normalize the fact that we don't know things. Yeah. And we need to respect yeah. when scholars say I don't know because that's the most. Um, it's the most uh, respectable thing to say uh, as opposed to, oh, that guy doesn't know something. He's not a good scholar. It's a sign of good scholarship when a scholar admits they don't know. I appreciate that. Yeah. I hope that will be something we practice. And if you do find bad 
things. You can cherry pick and find stuff that's absolutely bad. Keep in mind, not everyone who identifies with certain groups or particular religions or anything think the same way too. So there, there's a lot to investigate before drawing conclusions. And I'd be cautious of any conspiratorial channels out there that continue to propagate hate towards people who are a minority. Anyway, Justin, love you. Never forget, we are Myth Vision. We're still live. You know why? <laughs> My mouse died. And what better time than this than this uh pay this uh super chat here? So Tux TV, I'm charging my mouse just long enough to be able to end this broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing how Hollywood, higher education, science, evolution, D D gaming, and atheist all are for the devil. The Bible, where we learn of this evil mastermind, not from Satan. I don't even know if the Bible's where we really learn about that much. I mean, you get you get the hints. Bad things happen in the Job, right? But even that's like uh, that. You know, again, in the Hebrew Bible, there's no there's no Satan. There's just a there's a, a member of the divine council. That's the uh, adversary. He's it's Satan never occurs as a as a name in the Hebrew Bible. It's Ha Satan, the opponent. It's a title. Mm -hmm. So he's a member of the divine council. So yeah. The concept of a of an evil devil character doesn't come along until Jewish apocalypticism much later and eventually into Christianity. So Satan as an idea developed over time and doesn't mm -hmm. really it doesn't really occur in in the Hebrew Bible. Um, doesn't really occur in the Hebrew Bible at all. I hear it has Persian influence though. Uh, in, yeah, in and pro probably the pro probably the Jewish apocalypticism is very likely influenced by um, like zero, you know something like dualism that's coming out of the time that the, the, that the Jews, the Judeans spent in, in Babylonia and they bring back some dualistic ideas. But, but in the Hebrew Bible itself, we see very little evidence of that kind of, of uh, that kind of dualism a little bit in Daniel, but, um, but not anywhere else. In fact, the Hebrew Bible doesn't even have an afterlife hardly. It's just Sheol. Um, you know, even Ecclesiastes says, who knows if the spirit of a man goes up and the spirit of an animal goes down. Even Ecclesiastes doesn't even know if there's a, 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 a spirit that endures after death. So yeah, thank peace. you so much. I think we're going to officially end here now. My, my mouse works. <laughs>